We want to talk tonight about the, what is called in Scripture, the Battle of Gog and Magog. And if that sounds funny to you, it sounds funny to me too. It's weird words, but it's, you know, it's what it's, what it's called. Um, Gog and Magog. So what we've been studying is the end times eschatology, which means end times. Eschaton is just a Greek word that means the end. So when we talk about eschatology, it's endology, (laughs) or the study of end times things. And so we've been going through, and if just as a a really brief uh, recap, you can think of a question mark, the number seven, the number 1,000, and then an arrow. Okay, if that helps you, right? A question mark, a seven, 1,000, arrow, okay? Uh, the question mark would be the time between now and when these end times things start. Seven would be the time of this great tribulation and difficulty that comes on the earth. After that is a thousand years of Christ reigning. And after that is an arrow, just eternity with a new heaven and a new earth. Right? So if, if that gives you just sort of a simplified, we don't know how long before it starts, but once it starts, there's seven years, then there's a thousand years reign, with Christ reigning, and then there's eternity. And what we're doing now, we've, been, we've gone through all, the, all the, the seven year stuff, all the tribulation stuff, and, now, and then we've gone through most of the questions that we that we've, can answer from Scripture on the millennial kingdom, and now we're getting to the end of the millennial kingdom. Now, before we get to the end of the Millennial Kingdom, there was um, a few questions that came up uh, last week. Actually, one question in particular about the... Um that doesn't help when I drop my notes. So, uh, we, we had a question about what's going on with the, with the sacrifices. Are there really sacrifices taking place during the Millennium? Remember, Jesus has returned. He set up his kingdom on the earth. There's no animals aren't attacking people, and, and it seems like they're eating straw like oxen and all that kind of thing. So why is it that, that there are sacrifices? Well, first, let's go to a few passages of Scripture where we do see that there's sacrifices taking, on, taking place during this time. And this will sort of wrap up what we didn't finish last week about the sacrificial system and all that. Um, If you want to keep your finger in Revelation, or if you just want me to read it, that's fine. I'm going to go to Zechariah chapter 14. The prophet, the minor prophet Zechariah, who gives us quite a bit actually about the, uh, the millennial kingdom and the end times. Zechariah 14, and um, we read this last week. But in verse 16, it says, uh, in this context of what's taking place during the thousand years while Christ is reigning on the earth, it says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there were basically six main feasts that were, that were um, you know, celebrated every year in the Hebrew calendar, three of them would be all together uh, during around the time of Passover, Passover being one of them, um, and then three of them were all together around the Day of Atonement, and one of those around the Day of Atonement, you had the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. They would go, be back to back, so you only have to travel to Jerusalem one time, uh, twice a year uh, for, for these events. And this was about halfway through the year, where the, their year would begin with the Passover. That's sort of at the beginning of the year, the first month of their year. And then halfway through their year, they would have the celebration of the Feast of uh, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, one of the things that happens at the Feast of Tabernacles is every day for a week, they're living in tabernacles, or living in tents, to remind them of their wilderness wanderings, the Jews, uh, how they wandered from Egypt, right, and stayed in tents. And the other thing that they're doing every day during the Feast of Tabernacles is offering sacrifices every day, burnt offerings. So if people during the Millennial Kingdom are going to Jerusalem every year to uh, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, 
than they are offering sacrifices. You can read about the details of the Feast of Tabernacles in Leviticus 23. If someone's taking notes and wants to jot that down, look at it later. Um, but there's another passage I want to take you to in Ezekiel. And this will be a little easier because we're going to be going back to Ezekiel in just a moment um, about Gog and Magog. So I wanted to bring you to Ezekiel 43, if I could. Ezekiel 43. Now, Ezekiel chapter 40, all the way to the end of the book, chapter 47. I think it has 47 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but those last chapters of Ezekiel, from chapter 40 on, are all about the millennial kingdom and or the reign of Christ. So some of it's about the new, you know, the new heavens and new earth where Jesus is reigning forever. And uh, it's actually describing a new temple. It just ends up describing a new city of Jerusalem. Read through it sometime. And knowing what it's describing, you'll, it'll be a little bit more fascinating to you. Because uh, when you read it not knowing what it is, it's just a measurement of this and a measurement of this. and a measure. But once you realize this is actually measuring like a, the, the temple and the altar and all this stuff in the new, uh, in, the, uh, in the millennial kingdom... And, and the waters coming out from under it and all that kind of thing. But in verse 13 of Ezekiel 43, he starts to measure the altar. So there is an altar in the temple in the millennial kingdom. And it says, and after these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. And he goes through and he measures the altar. And so we know then that if there is an altar in the temple, and they're going up to worship, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, then there are sacrifices that take place. Now, this, is, this makes sense because death is still in existence, right? At the end of the millennium, we might get to it today, but I doubt it, we're going to read about how death is the last enemy that Christ conquers. At the end of the millennium, he conquers death. There is no more death which means in the new heavens, the new earth, there's not going to be any sacrifices because nothing dies. But before then, there is a remembrance brought up every year of Christ's sacrifice by sacrificing in the temple. Just like in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice in the temple to remember that the Messiah would be coming or that's what they would, were supposed to be remembering. And in the same way, in the millennial kingdom, there'll be sacrifices to remember that the Messiah came. You say, well, that's, that's terrible for those animals to die. Well, it's terrible for animals to die in the Old Testament too, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's sad, and that's the whole point, right? It, it's supposed to make us sad. It's supposed to remind us that Jesus died for us and, you know, that our sins deserved uh, what our sins deserve and uh, why it's so, um, so important and special that Jesus died for our sins. So uh, we're going we're gonna to move on, but before we do, any other questions about the Millennial Kingdom? Yes. Now, I could be wrong, and I'm going to have to take this back later, but I don't know of a passage in Scripture that says Jesus is the final sacrifice. Jesus is what all the sacrifices were pointing to. None of the sacrifices actually did anything. Like, sacrificing an animal didn't take your sins away. Sacrificing an animal showed that you were trusting in, in the coming Messiah, who is going to be the actual sacrifice. The animals couldn't actually take your sin away, right? So I don't think that Jesus is the last sacrifice, or at least I'm not aware of a passage in Scripture that says that. And instead, he is the sacrifice that all the other sacrifices were a picture of. And so all the other sacrifices just showed us that there needed to be a real one in the future. And so apparently in the, in the millennial kingdom, there will be remembrance of Christ in sacrifices. And it also will remind us that the world isn't quite perfect yet and that there still needs to be a, a, a finishing of the, of the redemptive work of Christ, which will, of course, happen, and we're about to read about it. <laughs> All right, let's look at Revelation 20 because we're going to get to this thing called Gog and Magog. All right? Now, remember, Revelation 20 on that question mark 7, 1,000, and arrow, right? <laughs> that, Sounds like hieroglyphics, right? Um, we're, we're past the seven years, what people like to call the tribulation. We're past the thousand years. We're actually at the end of the thousand years. 
right before God creates a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, so this is at least 1,007 years from today, at least, okay? <laughs> Probably more than that, but at least, okay? Here's what it says. Um, I think I'm going to start at the first verse, just to give us the background, okay? And I saw an angel, this is the beginning of the thousand years, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. There's the beginning of the thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, here's the end of the thousand years. Uh, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And that's the end of the battle. <laughs> um, okay, so interesting that this phrase, Gog and Magog, is sort of just thrown in to this battle. This is the end of the millennium. What happens is that Satan has been bound for a thousand years, and then God says, go let him out. Now, yeah, that's, uh, thank you. I was just going to say, you might say why, and you actually asked it, so that's perfect. Thank you, JP. I, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the, the question is, why? Why does why does God let the devil out? You know, if you've got him bound, why do you let him go? Well, because there are people that after a thousand years are still not believers. And it's time to end it. It's time to wrap it up and move on, right? So, Satan's going to go out and this is just going to, this is going to, this is going to, this is going to reveal the, the people who aren't truly saved. Because the ones who are, who are genuine believers during this time, Satan's not going to be able to mess with them, right? And so he's going to go and deceive the ones who aren't, and they're going to come against Christ, and it's actually the Lord's roundup tool, right? He's rounding them all up so that he can, he can wipe them out. They don't get to, to actually fight the battle. They, they start to wage the war, and immediately fire comes from heaven, and devours them. But what's interesting is that it throws in this statement, Gog and Magog, in the middle of this. Now, there's really only one re thing that this can be re referencing, and that's found in, Revelation, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38. Okay, so this battle at the end of the millennium is called Gog and Magog in Revelation 20, or at least the people, or, or something like that, is referred to as the Gog and Magog. In Ezekiel 38, we read the only other reference to this thing, or at least this name in the scripture, Gog and Magog. And here's what it says. We'll start at, at verse 1, and we're going to just work through Ezekiel 38 and 39, and we may just probably take two weeks to do it but we're going to try to understand what it says. Verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Okay, let's pause right there. <laughs> where, where are these places? What is this talking about? Gog is, uh, Gog is basically a, a person. He's saying this is, he is the king or the leader of this place called Magog. All right. Now, Magog is, 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 
found in Genesis, actually, as one of the sons of Japheth, the grandson of Noah, right? So uh, Magog and also Gomer, who's going to be mentioned later in this passage, also a son of Japheth. So uh, it's generally agreed upon by all commentators and scholars that Magog is referring to the Scythians. Scythians were a people who sort of controlled um, very similar land to what's now called Russia. Very similar land. Uh, they actually went a little further into, the, uh, into what we call today Europe than Russia does. Um, but they had the northern area north of, of Turkey and, and, uh, and Georgia, and pretty much everything north of that was all the Scythians. And so he's talking about Gog, who was, as far as we can tell in history, not an actual person in history. And he says to you, Gog, who's from the land, who's in charge of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, it's interesting that the word chief there, in, if, you've, if you've got a King James, it's translated chief. Other, other uh, Bibles might translate it differently because the word chief is, is sort of a quizzical word. Nobody really knows how to translate it. And some people think that that word chief uh, that's used, the Hebrew word that's translated chief there, um, actually is an ancient form of Russian. So they'll you know, say that this is also could be Russian. Um, but it seems like the, the word Magog already ties this to Russia. So we're, we're probably talking about the area that's controlled by Russia. Meshach and Tubal are, from my research, as far as I can tell, going to be the land of Armenia and Georgia, which is right there next to Turkey, right? So again, right about where Russia is today. Um, it says, now, he's the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and he's, here's the prophecy that comes against him. And say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horsemen, horses and horsemen, of all them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them have, have handling swords. So this is... I had, uh, Gog and Magog is this guy named Gog who's getting together this great army. Okay, here's who's also included in the army. Verse 5, Persia, that would be what we know today as Iran. Ethiopia, that would be what we know today as Ethiopia. <laughs> and uh, Libya, and of course, that would be what we know today as Libya. And uh, with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer... This is probably speaking, these two next two names are probably speaking about places, parts of Turkey. Gomer and all of his bands, the house of Togarma. <clears throat> Those two probably both speak to different parts of Turkey. Um, and of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. So here we have sort of nations from all around Israel. We're talking about what we would know today as Russia Turkey, Georgia, uh, Armenia, that whole area, plus Iran, plus two nations from Africa, Libya and Ethiopia. And then verse 7 says, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and thy company, that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited... In the latter years, okay, this is definitely even Ezekiel's betraying that this is talking about a end times event. In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. Now, this is an interesting statement, an interesting way for Ezekiel to describe Israel. Because Israel was, in the time of Ezekiel, it, was, it had been spread into one nation, right, into the Babylonian Empire. At, well, and maybe the Assyrian Empire, but that was conquered by Babylon. So they were kind of in the Babylonian Empire. And when they came back from Babylon and, and settled again in Israel, they came back from one nation. But here it says that they're going to come back from many nations and come back into their land. Now, I think this is an obvious, we can see after 1948, that this is talking about end times events that couldn't happen until 1948, 
when the Jews came back into their land after the World War II and repopulated their land. This seems very clearly to be speaking about more modern current events and saying that that type of thing had to happen before what's going to happen next. Okay, so in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. And by the way, the reason that Israel re went back to their land and, and the UN made a place for them is because of the, the Holocaust and how they, were tried to, they tried to stamp them out in the Holocaust. They were brought back from the sword. I mean, very, very specifically fulfilled this, this prophecy. They were brought back from the sword from many nations back into their land. But this takes place, um, it says, look, um, out of many people against the mountains of Israel, that means Gog and Magog are coming against the mountains of Israel with all these armies, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So this has to take place when Israel is dwelling safely in their land after they've come back from many nations. Well, that makes sense because we've already seen in Revelation 20 that Israel's dwelling very safely after a thousand years with, with the Messiah, right? He's, they're dwelling very safely in the land, right? Okay, but that's not all, because what we're going to find here, and I'll, 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 instead of going through the whole thing and then telling you the secret, what we're going to find here is that this is going to be a dual fulfilled prophecy. That means it, it has two fulfillments, now you say, well, what is it? That, you can't just make stuff up like that, Pastor Barnes. Well, we saw this already, right? In Daniel, Daniel describes this abomination of desolation, and he says it's going to be a Greek king during the Greek empire. Then he says, no, it's going to be a Roman king. And then he says, well, it's the Greek king, but he's a picture of the Roman king. And you, that's basically what, Romans, uh, what uh, Daniel 11 is all about. And so there was a dual fulfillment that was supposed to be something that was going to take place once, and then something very much like that was going to take place again later and so it was prophesying about both of those events that's gonna we're gonna find that that's clearly what's being taking place here one of these this prophecy is going to be describing the battle at the end of the millennium and it's also going to be describing another battle sometime before it and the question i want i want us to be asking ourselves as we're as we're walking through this passage is when is the first fulfillment okay we're gonna we're gonna have some people argue that it, this is talking about the um, Battle of Armageddon as the first fulfillment and the final fulfillment is at the end. Other people will argue that it's a, it's a battle that takes place sometime in the middle of the tribulation sometime. And others will argue that it's a battle that takes place before the tribulation and might even happen before the rapture, that we might even see it in our time. And um, it's easy to think that way because of where Russia is right now and because of the alliances that Russia is making with Iran and so on and so forth. So it's easy to start thinking that way, but I don't want to interpret scripture based on what I'm seeing in the world. I want to interpret the world based on what I see in scripture, right? So let's, let's be careful not to let that get backwards, okay? So let's see what it actually says here, all right? So they're going to come after Israel during a time when they're peace and safety. That part seems to be obviously talking about the, the last fulfillment at the end of the millennium, because that's when they've been for a thousand years peaceful and safe, right? Verse 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and shall be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and uh, having neither bars nor gates. Now this, some people will point to this and say, this is saying, this is meaning that, it's, that the first fulfillment of this is before the tribulation because right now Israel doesn't have any walls. Which is true. I mean, Jerusalem has old walls, but it doesn't surround the city. The city if you look at Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem on a map, the walls are this much and the city is this much, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's not really a walled city, it's, even though it has walls in it. Um, but can we really say that they're dwelling safely right now? I mean, yeah, they got the Iron Dome, so they can pretty much act like they're safe, but it's hard to, it's hard to see how that would be considered uh, just 
peaceful, safe, hunky-dory, don't, don't expect any kind of attack, right? Because they're expecting attack all the time right now in, in Israel. They, I mean, everyone in Israel, when you hit 18, joins the military, period. <laughs> Why? Because they're not like, the, the idea here is that Israel it feels at rest and safe. And right now, I don't think that's what you, a good way to classify Israel. Um, so I, I would say that's probably not a good reason to argue that this is going to happen before the tribulation. This probably is still talking about the end of the millennium after for a thousand years they've been at peace with Jesus as their, as their king. Verse 12, so that he comes to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. <clears throat> now remember, in the millennium, the desolate places start to grow again. The, the deserts start to grow again because of the water coming out of the city of Jerusalem. And so the desolate places that are now inhabited um, is what they're trying to conquer. Um, and it says, uh, And upon the people that are gathered out of all the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. <clears throat> Sheba and Dedan... And the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Now, Sheba and Dedan are basically different parts of Arabia, what we would call today Saudi Arabia. And so some had said, well, this, this can't happen until Saudi Arabia starts to line up with... with uh, with Russia, and right now Saudi Arabia is a rather um, peaceful uh, country as far as Middle Eastern countries go. They're in the talks of making um, deal uh, a peace deal with Israel. But notice that this passage doesn't say that, that Saudi Arabia or Sheba and Dedan are actually coming against Israel. They're actually asking Gog and Magog as they're coming against Israel, why are you coming? Right. So it doesn't look like they're part of it. Um, so that, that wouldn't really affect our, our interpretation here. Verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God in that day, when my people Israel dwelleth safely, that shalt thou not know it, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now you might say, why are they riding on horses? Well, if this is in the middle of the tribulation, it would make sense, because They've had tons of earthquakes and all kinds of things that probably set them back in their technology. If this is the end of the millennium, we have no idea uh, what's going on then, and it's possible that they would ride on horses because they're not exactly, exactly manufacturing tanks all around the world at that time, right? Uh, but if this is before the tribulation, then the horses would then have to be a metaphor, right? Because they wouldn't be riding on horses in a big army right now, right? Um, verse 16. And thou shalt come up upon against uh, my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. Again, a reminder that this is an end times prophecy. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now, this is an important verse. Look at verse 17. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old Time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. So this is an important figure in Bible prophecy who's been prophesied to come against Israel. Now when the, at the time when Ezekiel was writing, we don't know how many other prophets had prophesied things that weren't written. But Isaiah had written stuff. And he had written... Um, about, about armies that would come up against Israel. And, uh, but he, you know, other than generically talking about Satan, he hadn't really talked about like the Antichrist or anything like that. That was Daniel, and he was writing kind of at the same time as Ezekiel. It wasn't something that Ezekiel could say, you know, hey, haven't all the prophets always talked about this? This sounds to me like he's, he's saying, Gog, you are Satan. Like, this Gog figure is the devil, right? And he says, you're the one who's been prophesied to come for a long time and come out against Israel. And that makes sense because in the final fulfillment of this, it is Satan himself who comes against Israel. And there is one other time we know 
when Satan comes against Israel, and that's at the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the seven years of tribulation. So now I'm thinking, if, as I'm reading, this is probably a dual fulfillment, first fulfilled at the Battle of Armageddon, and finally fulfilled at the end of the millennium. All right? Well, let's, let's read on. It says <clears throat> um, that, uh, verse 18, It shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken sure. Uh, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Now, that's an interesting statement. It's talking about an earthquake that happens uh, during this battle. Anyone remember what happens at the end of the Battle of Armageddon when Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives? There's this great earthquake, and it seems like it might even coincide with that last vile judgment where there's this great earthquake. Well, there's going to be a shaking during this battle. It says, So that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down. The mountains are thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. This sounds to me like the Battle of Armageddon. Now, verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord, Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Now, this is interesting because part of the judgment, the seventh vile judgment, is hailstones. And remember what happens at the end of the battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium. They're destroyed by fire that comes out of, out of Jerusalem, out of the throne, right? And he says, I'm going to rain fire and brimstone or fire and sulfur on these people. Now, here's why we know this has to be dual fulfillment. It can't all be talking about the end of the millennium. And that's in chapter 39. 23 says, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 39. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord <clears throat> God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back, and will leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. Now, just pause for a second. And remember when the Antichrist first comes on the scene and the first seal is opened and there's a white horse. Does anyone remember what he has in his hand? He has a bow, but no arrows, right? Because he's promising peace and so he has no arrows, right? He's got a bow like, you know, like, hey, I could, I could be fighting you, but I'm not because we're going to have peace. And then, of course, by the end of the tribulation, he's fighting, and he's got the arrows. Well, look what it says here. I will smite thy bow out of thy, hand, thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. This sounds a lot like the Battle of Armageddon to me. It really does. And remember that the Antichrist in the Battle of Armageddon is controlled by Satan. So if Gog is speaking about Satan, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, it says then... Um, <clears throat> verse 4, thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds. Does anyone remember what happens at the end of Revelation 19? There is a feast of the birds on the bodies. You remember that? Now, verse 5, thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord, and I will set a fire on Magog, and, upon, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore, which doesn't seem like it's possible if we're talking about a before the tribulation thing, because remember, God's name is going to be polluted more than ever in the middle of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation. It says, And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord, that this day whereof I have spoken. 
And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears. And they shall burn them with fire seven years. Now remember what happens at the end of the thousand years of the millennium. At the end of that time, the, it's, it's the end, right? God, there's the earth and the heaven flee away. God creates a new heavens and new earth. There's not seven more years to gather up all the weapons. There's no need to. Plus, they're burning the weapons. Were, weren't, weren't, wasn't, weren't they destroyed by fire? <laughs> Why would you need to burn burnt weapons, Right? Apparently, this is, a, this is why we know, we know without any real question that there has to be a dual fulfillment here. That final Gog and Magog battle is mostly described in chapter 38. But that first fulfillment of the Gog and Magog seems to be in chapter 39. And this is talking about something different that afterwards is going to take them seven years to clean up all of the dead bodies. And this is why the seven years, this is the chief reason why people will argue that this has to happen right before the tribulation. Because seven year tribulation, seven years cleaning up the dead bodies. Um, but I don't think so, and I'll, I'll show you why. Here's what it says in verse, uh, where are we on? Verse 9, verse 10. So that they shall take no uh, wood out of the field, neither cut down any of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rod those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. And shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of the graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers in the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noises of the passengers, and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. So there's seven months burying the bodies, seven years cleaning up all the weapons. All right, seven months burying the bodies, again, is not necessary if they were all burnt, right? Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown in the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. So this is a privilege, to be honored of God, to be one of, the go, one of those who goes out and buries the bodies of his slain. That seems obviously to be talking about the Armage Battle of Armageddon, right? Because it's God's slain that he slew, and everyone's going out there in honor to God to bury these bodies. So this is not something that takes place before the tribulation. It really demands that that first fulfillment of the Gog and Magog battle has to be the battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. When Jesus comes back and claims the kingdom for the next seven years, he's going to say, hey, you're the honored one. Go out and clean up those bodies. And they're going to think that's a wonderful thing. Like, thank you. I get to go, you know, you know, clean up the bodies of those foolish people who came against God. You know, it was like, it's like a, it's a renown, a thing of renown that you got chosen for that. And uh, I don't think I'll be chosen. I'm probably not good enough. But I wish that I could clean up dead bodies in the millennium. That would be great. Um, probably, I probably won't have to hold my nose with my, with my resurrected body. So, you know. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the day that I shall be glorified. It says, here's how they're going to do it. It even explains how they're going to clean up the bodies. Verse 14. They shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the pass passengers those that remain up on the face of the earth, and to cleanse it after the end of seven months shall they search. The passengers shall pass through the land. When any seeth a man's bones, then shall he set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. So they got this whole system. You know, one person goes through, he spots bones. Now notice that he's spotting bones. Again, they're not burnt, but they're picked clean by the birds, right? So all that's left is bones. So he spots the bones, he puts down the you know, he puts down the, the marker. Somebody else comes by, and he's going to all the markers and burying them, you know. And it says, And the name of the city shall be called Haman. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord, Speak unto every feathered fowl. Here we go again, the same thing we saw in Revelation 19. And to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves, and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, and of bullocks, and of the fatlings of Bashan. And you shall 
Eat fat till you be full, and drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus shall you be filled at my table. This is almost identical language to what we find in Revelation 19 about the birds coming and, and, uh, and devouring the flesh of those who stood against God. <clears throat> and it says, here's an interesting thing to note. Verse 22, and then we'll read verse 29, and we'll, we'll close after that. Verse 22, so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. So after this battle, going forward, Israel knows that he's God, period. Now, that's not talking about the, at, at the end of the millennium, because they already knew that, that for a thousand years, right, um, he's reigned. So this is talking about that first fulfillment, and that makes sense if it's the Battle of Armageddon. If it's some battle sooner than then, like before the tribulation, I don't think so, because the tribulation is about trying and purifying the people of God, and uh, so I don't think that would be um, from that day forward, they all know if it's before the tribulation. And in verse 29, it says, Neither will I hide my face any more from them. Meaning, I'm coming to dwell with them in person, and they get to see me in person, right? I'm not going to hide my face anymore after the battle of Gog and Magog, which again just says this seems obviously to be talking about the battle of Armageddon. And so why do people think that, it, that it's just describing something that happens before the battle of Armageddon? Well, because we're seeing pieces moving into place for this kind of a thing to happen. I mean, we are. I mean, just to see Russia's advancements in in the Ukraine. And I mean, Russia has a base in Syria and Damascus. And I I heard actually just today or yesterday that uh, Putin went to Iran to meet with the leader of Iran. I mean, look, these types of things are in the works. But I don't think we have prophetic reason to think this takes place before the tribulation, is all I'm saying. Although I'm 100% confident that the devil is trying to make this happen. And I think that's what we're seeing in the world right now. I think the devil is trying to move these pieces into place. And all God has to do is remove the church in the rapture, and he's going to let this all play out. Or he could say, no, hold on. It's not time yet. I'm I'm choosing not to allow it to happen. And he could make it, put it on pause for a little bit longer. It doesn't seem like he's doing that, though. It seems like we're getting very, very close to the Lord withdrawing us and in the rapture and uh, letting this play out, you know. Um, And that's, uh, that's exciting, right? That's pretty exciting. I think we need to be prepared, though. You know, as we discussed before, we don't know if if there will be some of this one world order stuff, if we'll see some of that before we're gone. Now, we don't know how dark and how difficult it might get before we go. Um, So I don't think it's, I don't think that this is a a reason for us to not be prepared for dark times. But ultimately, it's exciting, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to get this ball rolling. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very anxious to be done with the question mark, okay? And then, uh, <laughs> then we can let the seven years play out, and then we can get on to that thousand years with Christ on this earth. And then next week, we're going to get into the new heavens and the new earth. And, uh, and of course, that's what we're ultimately looking for. But next week, we'll do uh, the great white throne judgment, and uh, maybe we'll get into the new heavens and new earth. All right, let's pray, and we'll close. Father, we do thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you that when we look at the scriptures, we can find answers to our questions. And we thank you that you gave us so much of the scripture uh, to deal with end times events. I mean, this is not a small portion of scripture. This is perhaps 20 or so percent of the word of God is dealing with end times stuff. And we thank you that we, we can look at it, we can examine it, we can find what you mean, what you mean by it, we can be um, careful with it. And we can let your Holy Spirit lead us as we attempt to understand it. And we pray that you'd help us now, knowing that that these pieces are all in place. And all it's going to take is for you to say, go ahead, for all this to start happening. Um, Help us to be ever vigilant. Help us to be those who are going out and reaching the lost and bringing people to, to Christ and using whatever time we have left, because it's very likely that we have very little time left. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to you coming at any moment 
And we thank you for it. Even so, Lord Jesus, we pray, come quickly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.